It was 1921 Eastern Europe. World War I was over, but the smell of death still prowled the streets. Hundreds of thousands of children were orphaned from fighting and disease, among them nearly half a million who were Jewish. Many of their parents had disappeared or been killed by Cossacks, horsemen who frequently raided the small Jewish communities across the Pale of Settlement in today's Ukraine, Eastern Poland and Belarusia. They killed everybody in our town. When somebody asked a, a little Christian girl what did she knew about it, she said, oh, my grandfather told us there was a lot of blood. Sissy Harris was born in the tiny Ukrainian village of Kostopil. Both her parents died of dysentery when she was three years old. She has only one memory of her hometown. When we were small, my mother would send Lisa and Jack into the forest to look for the green leaves. If we found it, she would make a meal. If we didn't find anything you could eat, we didn't. Stories began filtering through to the South African Jewish community, many of whom came from these areas, of the desperate plight of the families they'd left behind. They approached Isaac Achberg, the head of the Cape Town Jewish Orphanage, who convinced then Prime Minister Jan Smuts to allow 200 Jewish orphans into the country. In a journey that took nearly two months, Achberg travelled by wagon, foot and car, picking the children up as he went from the forests, synagogues, orphanages and sometimes the streets themselves. There were children from three months to 15 years. A girl of three months was, was found under a tree with a sister but the, who was three years of age. And they asked the sister, what is your sister's name? And she said, I don't know. Sully's father was killed by the Cossacks when his mother was six months pregnant with him. Unable to care for him, she begged Ochberg to take him to Africa, a place she'd never heard of. She gave Solly this photograph of herself, with her name and address on the back. The only clothes we had was our shirt and our shorts. But I didn't have a pair of shorts, so my mother took my elder brother's shorts and altered it and gave it to me. And we travelled all the way from Lemberg to Cape Town in that pair of shorts and shirts. The only way we could travel was by cattle truck because it was after the Great War and no passenger trains were available. So they put us all a hundred children in each cattle truck. And we had to stand all the way to a station where the engine stopped to fill up with water and, and coal. The children travelled by train to Danzig on the Baltic Sea and then by boat to London. But a few ran away before they could set sail for South Africa, saying they were frightened they'd be eaten by lions or sold into slavery. Of the original 200, 181 arrived in Cape Town. They gave me an orange in Cape Town and I'd never seen anything so beautiful and I wouldn't part with it till I got to Johannesburg. Sissy and Solly were among the group sent to Johannesburg and housed in an old age home in Dornfontein. They slept on mattresses on the floor. Later, the Jewish community bought Villa Arcadia and turned it into an orphanage. The Russian children moved in. A lady by the name of Mrs. Josselovitz and her husband came to see the orphans. And I saw this lady and I grabbed her by the skirt and I said, Mama. But I couldn't speak to her because I only spoke Polish and she was a Lithuanian, so she only spoke Lithuanian, Jewish and English. She had no intention of, of adopting a child, but, but I wouldn't let her go. So she decided with a Jewish heart she wouldn't leave me. So I gave her the envelope, which I carried right through Europe in my pocket, and she, she wrote a letter to my mother and told her that she would look after me. They were wonderful people, and they had a daughter of 27, so you can just imagine how old they were. There are today more than 4,000 children and grandchildren of the original Achberg orphans. In a search to better understand their history, this small group of descendants traveled to Brest in today's Belarusia to retrace their parents' footsteps. Right here, mm -hmm. 
My mother was actually born here, came from Brest as an orphan. We don't really know much of my mother's family. She never knew what happened to her parents in the First World War and who her parents' parents were, we've got no idea. This man has devoted his life to recording the history of the Jews of Brest. But as it turns out, he'd never heard of a man called Ochberg or the children who disappeared with him into Africa. You look for the name of Tuska. Могли бы вы найти фамилию Алтуска? Да. Алтуская. Йенга. Ривка. Uh, these are names, Anta, Rivka. Sara, that's my mother. Sure, Sara. amazing. Yeah. Jewish history has all but disappeared from Brest. This used to be the Jewish cemetery. In the 1930s, it was razed to the ground by the Soviets and a football stadium was built on top. The tombstones were stolen by locals and used for pavements. I was asked how do I feel about coming to this place. There's a very great possibility that my grandparents, my mother's parents were buried here. This is the end of the Jewish presence in Brest. Even here, in the small Jewish museum, there's no record of Isaac Ochberg. This is the old synagogue that was destroyed in 1942 and a cinema was built in its place. It's believed that Ochberg picked up some of his children from here, among them Tanya's parents, who were both Ochberg orphans. It's the full form 